Good evening. Welcome to our second service today from Buckingham Chapel in Bristol. Let's begin our time of worship by hearing from Psalm 130. A Song of Ascents Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let us sing to God our first hymn, Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Let us pray. Most blessed God, most high and most holy, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We worship you, the Almighty. You, Lord, are the judge of all. You are the creator of heaven and earth. 
You are the great God who made everything and who sees everything. Where can we flee from your spirit? Our Father, we thank you that you have made a way for sinners like us to come to you. Thank you that it is not by our deeds, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to your mercy that you saved us. For with you there is mercy, with you there is abundant redemption. And we know that we were not redeemed with silver or gold, with such corruptible things that men count precious, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, without blemish and without spot. The one who was foreordained in eternity, but revealed in these last days for us. And through him, Father, we believe in you and we worship you today. We thank you that we can come clothed in his righteousness and washed in his blood, born of his spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, with that comforter, that helper whom he promised to send to us. And Lord, we do thank you that uh, we are not alone. We are not orphans in this world. We are brethren of one another and we have a father in heaven. And not just in heaven, but who is drawn near to us by the Spirit. Lord, we thank you that we can cry out to you, Abba, Father, and that you hear us for the sake of your beloved Son, your only begotten, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we do pray that you would accept our worship this evening, that you would be glorified in it, that you would uh, take pleasure in the praise of your people, that we would rejoice in the privileges that we have been given in the gospel, that we would sing to you, Lord, with all of our hearts, that we would hear your word uh, gladly and carefully and obediently, that we would put it into practice this coming week. Oh, Father, do keep us from sinning, keep us from stumbling, keep us from falling. Deliver us, we pray, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over us. Then we shall be blameless and we shall be innocent of, of great transgression. Lord, we pray uh, that you will have mercy upon your church all over the world, especially where they are suffering persecution from the devil's servants. Please protect your children, O oh Lord. Uh, please do uh, deliver them. Please uh, strengthen them even to the end if they must lay down their lives for Christ. May they count these sufferings all joy. Father, do help us, we pray, to imitate those who through faith and patience, inherit the promises and the crown of glory. Lord, we do pray that you will have mercy upon uh, the church uh, at Buckingham. We do thank you for each other. We thank you for our fellowship in the gospel. And Lord, we pray that uh, even as we now fellowship in this remote way via technology, Lord, that soon we will be able to assemble again and that you will be glorified, Lord, in all of our meetings, whether we are in the meeting in the flesh or just now uh, in spirit meeting together. Lord, we do thank you for our country and we pray your hand upon it, your mercy to be shown to us, Lord. Forgive us our many sins and please give wisdom to our leaders to govern us aright and to pass laws that are glorifying of you. Father, we do pray that you will bless the gospel as it goes out and thank you for our missionary brothers and sisters who are serving you overseas. Do protect them and help them, Lord. But we do pray that uh, we also would be missionaries where we are. We would be evangelists preaching the good news of Jesus Christ who died and rose again. How we thank you for him, Lord. And uh, we do pray that all we do tonight would be done in his name and acceptable for that reason. Please comfort our hearts, Lord. Please forgive the sins we've committed. Thank you that there is forgiveness with you. And thus we can fear you. We can worship and serve you. Please pardon our sins, Lord. Keep us from them. Uh, but do grant us that cleansing, that forgiveness, that clearing of which David spoke this morning. And Lord, we pray that uh, uh, you would help us to cast all our care on you and look to you through the challenges of this week, in the joys as well as the sorrows, Lord, in the things that we enjoy doing and the things that we, we grin our teeth and bear. Lord, help us to honour and remember you. Be with us now, we pray, and glorify your name for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now let's sing our second hymn, Tell Me the Old, Old Story of Jesus and His Love.
Please turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 18. John chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 12 to verse 27. John 18, verse 12. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door, and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Amen. Let's respond to God's word before we hear it preached with our third hymn. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die.
The Bible says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It teaches furthermore that he did this supremely by dying for them. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. In the 18th chapter of John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ begins his journey to the cross. And yet, the cross was not the only component of Jesus' sufferings. Even before he got there, as he was going, he was made to suffer in various ways. Two of these are in our passage this evening. The Son of God was tried and he was denied. The first by his enemies, the second by his friend. If this was not the worst part of his affliction, that being his abandonment by God, yet I think we can say it was not the least part of it either. To be arraigned as a rebel and blasphemer by a gang of hateful hypocrites was hard, but to be forsaken by a professed disciple was harder still. Truly the sufferings of Christ have here begun in earnest. John's account moves back and forth between the courtroom where Jesus was tried and the courtyard where he was denied. I think it'll be helpful if rather than go through verse by verse, we look at the three or four main characters of John's narrative. In Annas and Caiaphas, we see firstly a perverse priesthood. In the Apostle Peter, we see secondly a faithless follower. And in the Lord Jesus, thirdly, we see a stalwart saviour. These are our three points. This morning we went from good to better to best. In a similar way tonight, we start at the bottom and work our way up. So firstly, let us consider in Annas and Caiaphas, a perverse priesthood. Throughout his gospel, John has both included material not found in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and omitted events, or at least the details of those events that the others do record. He probably knew of these other gospels and had read them. Don Carson thinks he'd read at least two. Uh, and probably he doesn't want to repeat things he knows have already been said. Plus he has a limited amount of uh, parchment to write on. In any case, we have another example of this thing here. John alone records the Roman contingent, the detachment of troops that came with the Jewish uh, officers and with Judas to arrest Jesus. We met them last week. He's also unique in noting where the Lord was taken first after his arrest. In verse 13 we read, And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. John has already mentioned the latter individual, as he reminds us, verse 14. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Skipping down to verse 19, looking at that verse, we might think the high priest there, therefore, is Caiaphas. But verse 24 makes it plain that it wasn't. That verse says, Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So evidently we have two high priests and the high priest in verse 19 is Annas to whom Jesus is first taken. How is this possible that there should be two high priests in Israel? Well here's where a little background knowledge comes in handy. Apparently Annas had originally been the high priest of Israel but he was deposed, he was removed from that office by Pontius Pilate's successor for reasons I forget. The Jews didn't take kindly to that, and although his son-in-law Caiaphas was installed in his place, Annas was still regarded by the Jews, at least by many of them, as the true uh, and authentic high priest, 
since they didn't regard Rome's action as legitimate. Now Caiaphas was competent in his own right, rather too competent as we'll see. But Annas was still the real power behind the throne. And it's not just uh, extra biblical material that uh, tells us this. In Luke's Gospel chapter 3, uh, in one of those early verses, he refers to the high priesthood, singular, of Annas and Caiaphas. They were high priests together in a real sense. And in Acts 4, uh, when Peter and John are on trial, again we see these men, and in both passages Luke mentions Annas first followed by Caiaphas so it's clear Annas was the the big cheese so to speak so Annas is the high priest in verse 19 who asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine he didn't do this you understand because he was seeking the truth because he had a genuine interest to know more about this remarkable Galilean preacher who just possibly might be the Messiah. Not at all. This was a hostile interrogation designed to intimidate Jesus and get him to incriminate himself, catching him in his words, as well as forcing him to divulge the identity of his followers so they too could be rounded up in due course. This high priest, nothing more than a big bully. Unable to get what he wants, he packs Jesus off to his son-in-law something John, not, John notes without going into the details and like the other evangelists who focus on that second trial. What then of Caiaphas? Was he any better? I'm afraid not. Let's read verse 14 again. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This was back in chapter 11 verse 47 and following. There we read, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. Jesus had just raised up Lazarus from the dead. If we let him alone like this, they said, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place, seems to be the temple there, and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. We get a real flavour there of this man's arrogance. I mean, if that's how he regards his colleagues as, as know-nothings, as idiots, whatever does he think of the common people? Well, we know that too. Chapter 7, verse 49. This crowd, this rabble that does not know the law is cursed. The chief priests were saying, no doubt, Caiaphas among them. Nice. Worse, though, was his corruption. Caiaphas's corruption. It is expedient for us that Jesus should die. That is, it's convenient. It's favourable in the circumstances. So forget any notion of justice. Never mind about doing the right thing. No, Caiaphas says, let us do what's best for us. Whatever suits our fancy. Well, this is worthy of Machiavelli. Machiavelli, you may know, was an Italian uh, politician uh, and advisor to uh, whoever was in power there in Florence. In Italy, um, his name has come into the language as somebody who is devious, somebody or something that's devious and uh, cunning and uh, unscrupulous because he advocated that rulers should just do whatever is expedient. Machiavellian, a Machiavellian plot. Well, we expect that from a medieval politician. But this is the high priest of Israel here. This is the descendant of Aaron with the law of Moses to guide him. That law that we were hearing about this morning that is perfect. This is the man who mediates between the Holy Lord God and his covenant people. He should be setting an example of good conduct, someone whom you can safely follow. As it is, he's teaching and practicing expediency. If it feels good, 
do it. That's his example to the people, the people of God. Friends, we have here a corrupt priesthood in both men. And as appalling a sight as it is, we would do well to learn from it. The reality is, sadly, that the wicked often tend to be in authority, not only in the state, but also in the church. We see that throughout the Bible. Think of all the wicked men who occupied this same office, who persecuted the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New. It carried on throughout church history. Even in the New Testament, we read of ungodly men within the church. And in the medieval time, in the, in the papacy, we see the height of that and the, corrupt, the corruption of those popes. Uh, at the same time as Machiavelli, it seemed to reach its its height, or rather its nadir, its depth. The sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light, Jesus said. And they worm their way into positions of responsibility where they behave irresponsibly and exploitatively. One aspect of such corruption, which we also see here, is what's known as nepotism, the preferential treatment of family. Nepotism uh, comes from the Latin word for nephew. Uh, nephews, uh, that was the euphemis euphemistic term to refer to the illegitimate children of clergymen and even of popes who they put into positions of authority, preferring the family and so on. Generally speaking, families are good. The church is pro-family, but dynasties are dangerous. You've heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. Indeed, so thick that it can cloud our judgment. Churches have split over power struggles, often along family lines. Men have been appointed to office or have not been appointed because they belong to this or that family. Whether they were biblically qualified or not and called of God has been by the by. We have to be so careful as religious people that we don't become like Annas and his son-in-law Caiaphas. We are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. We must not be a perverse one. Let us be careful. Let us, each of us, examine ourselves and make sure that we, as Scripture repeatedly says, show no favoritism to anyone. Let us be careful, but don't let us be fearful. Because God can use wicked men like this. In fact, he used these very two, this corrupt couple, to bring about his great salvation. Back in chapter 11, verse 51, speaking of what Caiaphas had just said, John adds this, Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. The fullness of the Gentiles brought into the temple of God, becoming the temple of God. Well, that's the last thing these high priests would have wanted. And yet the Lord brought it to pass through their evil actions. Through the death of Jesus, God's children were gathered. And that would not have happened but for these men. The Lord watches over the strangers, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. And well may we praise him for it. So let us be careful but not fearful in light of such a perverse priesthood. Secondly, let's look at Peter, a faithless follower. I said earlier that the Gospels include and omit things that the others don't. But of course, there are many things that they all record. They all record the fact that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, that there was at least one trial, and that he was executed by Pontius Pilate by means of crucifixion. Something else that all the evangelists are careful to note is the behaviour of Peter. If Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, then Simon Peter denied him. John weaves his account of Peter's denials around Jesus' two trials, as we see here. 
when we compare John's account with the others, we notice several slight differences. Differences, I say, not contradictions. John alone records the presence of another disciple in verse 15 and 16. This was probably John himself, who was somehow known to the high priest and his household, perhaps through his wealthy father Zebedee's auspices. There are also variations in the way the questions are put to Peter. John's the only writer to note that it was a relative of Malchus, the high priest's servant, whose ear Peter cut off, who accused him last of all of being one of Jesus' disciples. All of this is actually what we'd expect from genuine eyewitness accounts, each person telling it as they saw and heard it from a different angle, as opposed to a prefabricated, agreed-upon tale. Just ask a detective constable if you... Uh, for that point, they know how they know when someone's telling the truth. They know how to tell. Well, now isn't the place to, to reconcile the four accounts. Uh, there are books that do that. Let us focus instead on the lessons to be learnt from this incident. The first thing to consider is that Peter had boasted that he would never deny Jesus. He had said, as recorded in Mark's Gospel, even if all are made to stumble, yet not I, I will not be. I will not deny you even if I have to die with you, he said to Jesus. I'm ready to lay down my life for your sake, he says here in John's Gospel, in chapter 13. That's what he said before the event. When it came to it, when it came to the opportunity to do that, well, he chose to save his skin to save his life, not to lose it. He had three opportunities to confess Christ and not once did he do the right thing, though he had boasted that he alone would do it. He alone could be counted on. Well, he, he denied Jesus worst of all, with the exception of Judas. Peter's sin against Christ was the worst of all the apostles. Again, we have reason to say with Paul, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let us not be self-confident, at any rate overconfident. Let us be conscious of our weakness and, and put our hope in God. Let us not imagine we are better or stronger than others. We don't know how we would react until we're in the same situation. So let us be humble, not boastful. Secondly, let's reflect on why Peter fell so spectacularly. He'd been more than ready to fight. We read last week in verse 10 that having a sword, he drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Peter did this because he misunderstood the nature of Christ's kingdom and his purpose in coming. Peter was hoping that he would be with the other apostles set in glory perhaps at Jesus right hand yes if anyone should be there Peter thought it was him but Jesus had taught them whoever would be the greatest among you let him be the servant of all and he said as well I haven't come to to take men's lives to destroy men's lives but to save them my kingdom is not of this world greatness is through serving before honor is humility as the proverbs say Peter wanted the glory, he just wasn't so keen on the humility as the route to get there. That's not what the natural man thinks. And because Peter had these misconceptions, he misunderstood Jesus' teaching. Yes, he perceived he was the Christ and he had trusted in him. Uh, in a real way, he was a, a saved, born-again man at this point. And yet, he still had not understood why Jesus had come to die. He did not know the cross as he ought to know it. And therefore, it's not surprising that with faulty theology, Peter falls so spectacularly. Don't believe those who say it doesn't matter what you believe. It does. And even as a Christian, if you believe wrong doctrines, they can lead you to have very bad and serious falls. Make sure you understand as much as you can, as correctly as you can, of the Bible's teaching and particularly the teaching of Christ and what the Christian life is meant to be. 
don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated him first. Don't seek great things for yourself. Don't seek them. Attempt great things for God and expect great things from him. Don't expect to be loved by the world. Otherwise, you will stumble when you need to stand. Thirdly, Peter put himself in a dangerous place. Verse 18. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there. For it was cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. A natural enough thing to do, I guess, given the temperature that night. But alongside the enemies of your Lord. These are the very people, it seems, who have been a part of that mob who've arrested Jesus in the garden. Uh, foolish thing to do. Jesus had taught Peter to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but here Peter seeks out temptation. You may say, well, did he not, as Matthew says, go to see the end of Jesus? Well, that, that's true. Matthew says that. And that might suggest some sense of loyalty to the Lord, that he goes to see the end. Although he's already forsaken him, he, he returned after a fashion. But Matthew also notes that Peter followed Jesus at a distance. He didn't want to get too close to Christ, lest he also be arrested and suffer. And yet he doesn't have a problem, it seems, rubbing shoulders with these servants of Annas and Caiaphas. Indeed, he hopes to be taken for one of them, just another face in the crowd. In short, Peter has a foot in both camps. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to identify with Christ, with God's kingdom, but he also wants to be part of the world. But he can't and we can't. As we saw a fortnight ago, looking at uh, Micah uh, and the passage in James that's similar to Micah chapter 1. James 4 verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity against God? Whoever therefore would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, an enemy of Christ. The crisis will inevitably come where you have to choose. Who you will serve. No man can serve two masters. Not indefinitely. He will love the one and hate the other. He'll despise the one and hold to the other. Peter fails. At this crucial point. The big fisherman with the big mouth commits a big sin. Not just once. But thrice. We shouldn't think it couldn't happen to us. And we should remember that evil company corrupts good manners. Therefore, there is a reason why the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. To please God and to protect yourself. Yes, we need to have non-Christian friends to witness to, but we must be careful how closely we, we fraternize with such. And particularly if they are godless opponents of the gospel not just non-christians but actually enemies of the cross we need to be extremely careful how we deal with such folk love them by all means but we must remember that as we are out to win them they are also out to win us thankfully in spite of this catastrophe this was not the end for peter as luke records in his gospel jesus said to him simon simon satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. He's asked for you. He's asked for all the disciples. But I have prayed for you, Simon in particular, that your faith should not fail. And when you are returned to me, strengthen your brethren, Jesus said. Luke chapter 22. And so he did. We'll look at Peter's restoration another time. But I mention it now so as not to discourage you. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, not even we ourselves. If we could jump out of his hand, we would have done. But he keeps us in his hand, he holds us there. When I feel fear, my faith will fail, Christ shall hold me fast. Now though, 
let's grieve over this dreadful lapse of Peter's and the dishonor that it did to Christ. Let's make no mistake, it was a, it was a bad, terrible thing. And let's reflect also on how we also have let down the Lord in similar, if not identical, circumstances. And may yet do so again if we're not very careful. True disciples have good intentions, but we're weak in ourselves. Jesus said to them, the flesh, the spirit is willing, your spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As Paul says, how to do, um, to, to will is present with me, to, but how to do what is good, I do not find. The strength and courage to stand for Christ is not to be found in our flesh or even in our spirit, but in God's almighty and holy spirit, whom he has given to us, that we should walk in his ways and be careful to keep his commands. By the power of the spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body and we live. As Peter, now restored, would later write, cast all your care on him, on God, because he cares for you. He resists the proud, such as I was, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So that was Peter, a faithless follower. But though we are faithless, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That leads us to our third and final point. We see here in Jesus, a stalwart saviour. A stalwart saviour. In a passage full of sinners, the Lord Jesus stands out as the only righteous man in this story. Just as a light shines more brightly in, in the thick darkness, so against this uh, backdrop, uh, Christ, glory and beauty is seen all the more clearly. We see his goodness and obedience to God in three ways. Firstly, in verse 12. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. It's surely obvious, given all we've seen in John's Gospel of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they could have done neither of these things, arrested him, bound him, had he not allowed them to do so. This is the man who, more than once, escaped from their hand, even passing through their midst. So why now does he allow himself to be taken? Why does he surrender himself? Well, he does this because this is God's will, because he knows this is why he's come, to drink the cup which my father has given me, verse 11. How can it be otherwise if the scriptures are to be fulfilled? He could call on 12 legions of angels to defend him. He doesn't need Peter's puny blade. When he could call on Michael, and Gabriel and the others. But no, he submits to this humiliation. Um, the one who founded the earth, fixed it so it should not be moved, allows himself to be bound by his creatures and later nailed to the tree. But we know, as the hymn writer says, "'Twas not the nails, O Saviour, that bound thee to the tree. No, t'was thy love, thy everlasting love, thy love to me, to me. Secondly, when he's questioned by Annas about his doctrine and disciples, Jesus responds defiantly. Verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. He did have private conversations with his disciples, of course. The point is that what he said to them was not substantially a different message to what he said to others. Yes, he gave them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But he was not double-tongued. He wasn't saying one thing in public and another thing in private. He was not like some of these revolutionaries who deceive the people with promises of of uh, equality and justice, and yet when they get into power, are uh, twice as bad as those who came before them. Notice Christ refuses to tell Annas what he wants to know. He will not turn in his disciples. He will not surrender them to save himself. Why not? Again, because it is not the Father's will. Verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, 
I have lost none. And because he himself loves them. Christ loves these men. Though they have forsaken him and fled, all of them. Though Peter is in the process of denying him. And Jesus knows this. Yet knowing, foreseeing all, he does not abandon them. But he protects them. He shields them. He acts as the lightning rod and deflects the wrath of the establishment on himself and away from them. That's the kind of saviour we have. Loving saviour. Meekly enduring sorrow. And third, he challenges his persecutors about their shameful, sinful conduct. Verse 21, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. You might wonder if Jesus is being just a little bit rude there in answering the high priest in that way. One of the temple policemen certainly thought so. He struck Jesus on the mouth saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Well, he's not being rude. He's not committing sin because Jesus knows, as I said earlier, that Annas is not genuine in seeking to know these things. He has uh, already made up his mind that Jesus of Nazareth is a deceiver and his, he's up to no good. And not only that, but it may well be the case, uh, there are some external sources that would suggest that it was the proper practice for when someone was accused for, not for them to speak for themselves, but in the first place for witnesses to be uh, brought and very first of all for the witnesses for the defendant to be questioned. And in which case, if that's correct, then what Jesus is doing here is is calling on these men to follow correct procedure. Rather like Paul does later in, in Acts chapter 23, when he stands before another high priest, Ananias, uh, who starts to treat him contrary to the law. And Paul challenges him for his wicked conduct. Likewise, Jesus says to the man who hit him, verse 23, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? The Lord Jesus needn't have offered that rebuke uh, that brought with it the risk of another slap. Why does he say it? Not for himself. He says it to prick this man's conscience, to lead him to repentance. Who knows? Maybe later this man thinking about this, maybe he did come to realize his sin. That he had struck an innocent man and such a innocent man, even the Christ. Even if he didn't, then Jesus was still challenging him, causing him to think. He was rebuking his neighbour. He was not suffering sin because of him, just as the law says we should do. It's too easy to pass by times when we ought to admonish one another. We don't want to be people always picking up on each other's faults. That's true, but... There are times when we ought to challenge each other and admonish one another. Paul was confident that the Romans could do that very thing. and We ought to be doing that more, I suggest. Uh, lovingly so. Having taken out the beam from our own eye before we try and take a speck out of another's. In all these ways, Jesus of Nazareth showed himself to be a stalwart saviour. A stalwart saviour. known to himself and God only to them was all the grief that filled his heart it was a lonely path he trod from every human soul apart and yet from the track he turned not back to where I lay in want and shame he found me blessed be his name Christ died for sin the just for the unjust to bring us to God who were far away from him Though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. All for love's sake, for love of the Father, and for love of the sinner. And how could his death have this effect? How could Jesus dying on a Roman gibbet bring sinners, reconcile sinners to a holy God? How could that be the centerpiece of human history? Because he himself is divine. He's the God-man. We have a hint of that here in the fulfilment of Jesus' words. 
Let's not forget his prior prophecy. Peter denied again, verse 27, and immediately a rooster crowed, just as Jesus predicted it would in chapter 13, verse 38. Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Every word shall come to pass spoken by our Saviour here because he is God our Saviour. The one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, being also God. Believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in the full sense of that title. And you will be saved. You and your household. Because he is a stalwart saviour who saves to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Perhaps this seemed at first a rather sparse passage to you. It did to me when I came to consider it. I thought, what on earth am I going to be able to, to get from here for God's people? Is there really that much we can learn from? Well, I've certainly been proved wrong. I believe we've seen just how much there is in a passage like this um, in John chapter 18. Jesus' trials and Peter's denials. In these we see man's wickedness in Annas and Caiaphas. Let us be careful also to see our own. We see our weakness as disciples that even with good intentions, those good intentions would lead us down to hell but for the intervention of God in his grace we see our weakness and we also see last and best of all Christ's righteousness our wonderful saviour our loving Lord and thank God for his righteousness because that is the basis on which we are saved if you put your hope not in yourself but in him and God can and will save you. Really, that's all you need to know. To be right with him from this passage. Man's wickedness, our wickedness, our weakness. But Christ's righteousness. So trust in him. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem you from all your iniquities. Amen. Well, let's conclude by singing our fourth hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, God with us, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains.
Let us pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Well, I hope you all have a very blessed week, and God willing, we'll see you again next Sunday.